Hello and welcome to A Call to Arms, a series of interviews discussing a range of issues relevant to defence with UK practitioners at the top of their profession. I'm Andy Young and I work for the Military Sciences Research Group here at the Royal United Services Institute on Whitehall. Each month, I will host an interview with a senior leader from within the UK Armed Forces, exploring the issues that face defence today and tomorrow, giving you the inside story on how the military orientates itself to face future challenges. This series is kindly supported by Airbus, a company that employs 12,500 people around the UK and contributes £7 billion to UK GDP. This month on A Call to Arms, we talk to Air Marshal Andrew Turner, Deputy Commander Capability for the Royal Air Force. Having previously commanded helicopter squadrons, wings, stations and forces, both in the UK and on, on operations, Air Marshal Turner is now responsible for delivering the RAF strategy through its people, equipment, training, infrastructure, and support. Air Marshal Turner, thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure, absolute pleasure to be here, thank you. Um, before we go into any of the fine detail, would it be possible for you to just give us a bit of background into your role and the capability directorate within the RAF? Yeah, of course, so uh, you probably pretty much touched it. My role as one of the two deputy commanders of the Air Force is really to look after the future uh, my counterpart, Air Marshal Jerry May, who is responsible for sort of delivering today. So he is today, I'm tomorrow in that respect. And I am responsible for everything to do with the future in that respect. So everything from doctrine and concepts through to applied military forms and ways in warfare, air operations concepts, space operations concepts, then drawing that down then into the sort of hardware and people from you know cloaking drones, hypersonic missiles, clever missiles, speed of light warfare, all the way to... HR policies and recruiting, uh, the connection into our cadets and, uh, you know, a, a growing thread into the digital architecture and, and, and ecosystem that we know that most wars will be fought through by, with and through in the next decade or so. So, yeah, it's a sort of wide ranging responsibility and uh, quite exciting. Never days the same. Never, no two days are the same. Uh, but if it was easy, it'd be boring, wouldn't it be? So, uh, you know, it's a great fun. It's a great fun thing to be responsible for for a short time. It's really interesting when you're talking about how how broad that is, but also then going down into the cadets, because that's one of the things that we don't normally think about in terms of growing our future personnel. We normally think of the, the journey starting at the recruit. Um, just thinking about that at the moment, where do you see the air cadets then, the air training corps, really feeding into this this through life um, people plan for the, for the RAF? So the, the Royal Air Force Air Cadets, a uh, combination of the CCF, RAF and the ATC, the Air Training Corps, is, um, they're, well, their strap line is the next generation Royal Air Force. I mean, that's what they refer to themselves as. They're obviously uh, a uniformed youth organisation with us, very much STEM focus, which is helpful for the nation in the broader sense. It's not a recruiting organisation for us. It's, uh, it's connected to us. We want to instil them with our values and standards and the ways that we conduct ourselves introduce them to air and space power and if they're interested we'll obviously have a conversation with them about joining what's fascinating about them though is that they are a depiction really of the modern and future royal air force they're they're sort of 50 percent women they're 30 percent black asian ethnic minorities if you had a, a room of a thousand cadets and said who can code 300 hands would go up you know they're it's the most amazing start in life they're fabulously confident able to speak on their own two feet lead people you know, they're, they're just an inspiring uh, and compelling and propelling organisation to be around. And so if there was to be any sort of visage window on what the next generation looks like or are, you know, where Astra is trying to take the Royal Air Force, then it's you know, very much personified by, by the air cadets in both forms. So, yeah, they're great to be around and uh, uplifting and invigorating in every sense. Thank you for, for that, because it, we, as I said, we sometimes lose sight of actually uh, many of the people who we recruit we've had this previous relationship with yeah. and then coming out the other end it, it's then um how that that goes on into into future employability having gone through that that entire career span myself um but then you, you started speaking just touched on on project astra there what what impact has astra had so far and where do you see it really developing in the future so it's had a, 
So it's fair to say it's two years in, um, closing in on three years um, at the, towards the end of this year. And it's um, been a great and interesting journey so far. I mean, Astra isn't so-called a program or project in MPLA sense. It's a, it's a depiction or a, a description, really, of our journey to this next generation that we can foresee. Um, it's not bound by time or by function and will evolve over time as well. It's really three things internally. Um, it's, uh, you know, the mobilization of our people to think differently, to encourage them to, uh, to challenge, to break rules and redefine them where we think that's appropriate, and to uh, sort of generate amazing array of, uh, of ideas that we could adopt across the service from the very uh, for, from the stations and organisations and squadrons, you know, from the bottom, if you like. And, it, and the second part of it is that there's also the really significant programmes and projects that I'm leading from within HQ Air Command to, to build the future of the Air Force, whether it's new planes and bombs and equipment or new infrastructure, new ways of training, different people policies, a digital re revolution. You know, these are the things that are programmatically big. Um, and, you know, if you sort of sum it, it's about... £7 billion pounds a year we're spending on Astra. It's a sort of significant thing of investment. Uh, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the mass on the stations, there's 1,300, 1,300 Astra ambassadors out on the units, all of whom are cogitating rapidly and vigorously, all of whom are bringing forward ideas. And, and it's those really good ideas that we have a sort of Dragon's Den format, which we then pick up and spread across the Air Force. And it's challenging the status quo. It's challenging where we've been and what we want to get after and in what sequence and priority. So, so it's a really interesting combination of above and below. Uh, but it is a profound journey to deal with the threats and challenges we face on the battlefield, the migration and appetite for government to want more from its air force, um, the population's interest in us being closer to them, more representative of society, our own people, you know, who are, it's sort of restless for change. And then, you know, in parallel with all that is the sort of technology that's moving fast around us that we've got to access and harness to our advantage before our enemies do. It's so broad, it's so wide ranging, but I'm, I'm fascinated by the number of ambassadors you have. Because I know from working on, on uh, the Commando Ethics Programme and the idea that we were going to have these ethical ambassadors, how did you get those embedded across the RAF? Because that's really where you start seeing the behavioural change. Yeah, that's right. It is. And these people are, um, are on all the stations. They're at every rank within a station. Um, some of the best ideas come from the very most junior ranks, um, which is really quite exciting. Um, we advertise widely, said you want to be part of this change journey. Would you like to be contributing, designing, delivering? And, uh, you know, it's come from there. We've had some fantastic ideas. Three corporals uh, from one unit have de developed a, an unbelievably clever above secret cloud technology, uh, which we've deployed, you know, in, uh, across the United Kingdom recently on a number of different aircraft. You know, so, so from nothing, from almost like Radio Shack, we've shifted to, you know, confront some of the nation's most difficult problems, you know, through an ambassador network, not through some gigantic program of record. Um, so it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's challenging the status quo, the approach that we're trying to solve. It's very, very, very exciting. Now, alongside, alongside uh, Project Astra, there's obviously an intent to rebalance training with an 80-20 synthetic live ratio. Um, yes. What impacts do we expect to see on the maintenance, sustainment and, and delivery of operations with, with that transfer? Yeah, so a couple of things on this. The first thing is that um, what we're talking about here is not total flying, but the, the force generation and, and training flying. The second point I'd say is that most of our aircraft now are so sensitive in their, in their signature, their capabilities, the weapon sensor effector dynamic, and also the communication structure, that uh, because of ubiquitous Earth sensing from space from our adversaries, we really don't want to operate them at the top end of their ability in the public domain, you know, outside of a hangar on an airfield certainly not in concert with our with uh, with dissimilar or similar types in other nations or even other domains so there is a sense now that we can't cannot force generate in the live environment because of uh, because of day one night one compromise so we're shifting all of our, our really t difficult and uh, challenging uh, force generation uh, activity into synthetic devices 
Now, this doesn't mean that we'll be flying our planes less. Um, it does mean that uh, in blunt and raw terms, the prime minister gets more of our hours than we do. So instead of going round and round in circles in Lincolnshire, you know, we'll do that in a wobbling box. Meanwhile, the aeroplane is being used for operations, either defending our nation or our national interests or supporting allies and partners around the world. So I think this combination of, ship, of, of adopting, you know, this hits on my five key drivers. It adopts technology where it's available and accessible today, protects our, our, our capability against adversaries, offers more to our prime minister on a day-to-day -day basis and gets after what our people are wanting, which is the most uh, lethal and productive and efficient training. So they're not wasting time. It is already the case that, that um, some of our air crew, you know, they, they crew in for a sortie and they're not sure if they go to a, a real plane or a simulator. And that's the sort of psychological orientation we should have our people in. No longer is it sort of a boring moment being sick in a sort of in a box on top of sticks. Now, now it's the best way to generate military, lethal, collaborative capability. Um, challenge we'll face here is twofold, I think. Firstly, the interconnectivity between us and other nations, not because of time zones, that's OK, but because of data and digital protocols. Should we say the signature data around an aeroplane will be very sensitive to a prime? So there's some really difficult uh, digital boundaries we need to cross there to make that possible. So that's an intra-domain. Inter-domain is even more challenging. The idea that we might better link down into, should we say, a land formation conducting its own battle procedure uh, that is genuinely largely un unsynthetic in its way it's force generates. Perhaps easier, let's say, in an anti-submarine warfare sense or a, a connection between the space and air, air power. A uh, little bit less easy, but still possible around, should we say, carrier-based aviation or literal manoeuvre. You know, as you, you referenced yourself around the Royal Marines earlier. So I think, you know, there's a lot more we can do, but certainly because we've been in synthetics now for 50, 60 years in the air domain, you know, it's novel. It's not novel to us. It's not new. It's just the latest ability to access, um, you know, technology and make it work for us. And making it work for us equals have a better capability against the adversary, offer the prime minister more, get after what our people are saying and be, be, be less profligate, should we say, with flying hours when facing the public whilst accessing technology. I think it's a really interesting point you bring, bring there when you're talking about the integrated operating, the multi-domain integration yeah. and how far certainly some, some of our elements need to come to catch up with actually having that, that, that leading edge and that, that groundbreaking edge whilst still being able to operate. Um, do, do you see there being a, um, a definitive moment when you go from being um, blank firing, as it were, into live firing? Is, can you see there being much more of a hard, a hard element in there? Or do you think eventually this will be a seamless transition through? So there's some interesting key interfaces. Let's let's um, take an example like the Air Maneuver Task Force. You know, taking the paras to work. Um, it, 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 you know, we can get them to the to the to the DZ or the LZ synthetically. You know, the idea of we're moving in a, in a mass formation. We might have loyal wingmen ahead. We're using space and cyber to break open the the air, to, uh, the air defense environment. You know, we're penetrating into places uh, and we're landing on surfaces which are unprepared or semi-prepared in some way with obstacles and holes, uh, maybe off, off airstrips, in, you know, on sand or, or, or even ice rivers. Um, but once you get to the, the, you know, the brakes are on, the engines are running and the ramp goes down, you know, there are no real powers to get out of your simulator. But that interface between you know, the, the, uh, the parachuting going out of the back of the aeroplane, the medium wet air dispatch pallet going off with a vehicle on it, or the resupply, uh, or rounds coming into the aircraft as you're trying to offload, you know, a company of parachuters. You know, that's quite difficult to, that's a seam you can't easily replicate without being in the live environment. I know from being a helicopter pilot, you know, you, there's some grubby difficult stuff you've got to do with real people and freight, you know, swinging uh, rations or ammunition around the low valleys in Germany in the 1980s it wasn't something that was easy to replicate in the simulator and certainly not the chaos of a landing site with 60 helicopters trying to land in a field all at once. So um, I think there are some these natural interfaces are, are, are difficult to replicate. You could argue the same as in the ASW environment, submarines, where, you know, it'll be a while before we can get 
the likes of Astute uh, or, you know, the D-boat, V-boats or successor Astute into, you know, a synthetic environment that's, that's networked into Poseidon, that's picking up on the wider sensor array that's deploying and hooked into Merlin and maybe protector of the future. You know, we can do most of those air interfaces together because it's a sort of domain, but but hooking into the subsurface environment quite difficult, where you're trying to sort of replicate the salinity levels and uh, I, you know the, the 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 different sort of seismic and sonic sort of transmission barriers that you might encounter. So I think there'll always be a seam, um, but we can do a lot more than we are doing today in that synthetic environment, and we can be much better at our job uh, through training and preparing in that medium. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating, because. This really talks about that that constant evolution and adaptation which all armed forces go through. Yeah. So when you're thinking about that, we've we've spoken about Astro. We're talking about the synthetic training. What what program, from your perspective, shows the most potential for growth, and which one are you most enthused by? So, I I mentioned at the outset my job is about to, to about tomorrow. Um, so we've got some really tough challenges on delivering for today. Availability, meeting the enemy toe to toe, hitting the Prime Minister's requirement for distribution around the world and at home and being ready to react, you know, as and when. Um, I'm really interested in the technology after next. And I, I judge and think that will be upon us far quicker than anybody's going to predict. Um, I think instead of it being the technology after next being, should we say, the next decade, it could be inside this parliament before 2025. Um, I'm thinking of a number of technologies, but let's let's take two in the digital terrain. You know, one, the the, the need for us to be adopting blockchain across our, our defense estate in operational planning, in defense intelligence analysis, in financial planning, human resource structuring, uh, aircraft certification and manuals, you know, training, you know, all sorts of reasons why disruption uh, at our heart in a data centric organization would be really painful you know so i think blockchain is a or something like that that sort of level of uh, uh protection is is going to be cr- crucial the other one which i think is potentially go- could change the way in warfare is the evolution of quantum computing in three specific areas one quantum communication the other encryption and the third one in gravity sensing you know if 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 the bets come off, and there's a lot of speculation, low TRL, but a huge amount of investment and work going on around Oxford and in, you know, in the sort of key brain centers of the United Kingdom. If this comes off, it means we'll be invulnerable in our communications, we'll be able to disrupt others, and we'll be able to see through you know, solid objects or the sea in some way. And that means that that's this, this concept that CDS talks about, about this duel between hiding and finding is gone. We see everything all the time. It's ubiquitous. And so if that is the case, our world has changed dramatically. You know, we, we're not going to be we're not going to be seduced by sort of multi-spectral stealth characteristics or uh, you know a misunderstanding of what's going on in the hardware environment. The challenge will then be our ability to properly understand and move at the pace that uh, you know we will confront adversaries' leadership. That will be an area where I think. The speed of quantum computing, you know, growth in a high number of qubits compute, computational power will help us understand the world in a new and different way. That's quite exciting. So that that future is uh, de- genuinely an area which if we're not on too quickly, we'll miss the boat and we'll be second. And there's no place on the battlefield for being second. No, I, I've never heard somebody put it in quite that that terminology before. And I find that fascinating when we think about the when we think about the kill chain and the sensors and the sensor, the fact mm. that we, we are seeing battle spaces flooded with sensors now, and it's those sensors which are which are changing yeah. The, yeah. The, uh, the the nature of the battlefield. Yeah. Um, when you look at all of this and you and you see us taking these big bets going forward, is there anything that gives you pause that that makes you think, hang on, do I need to step back and just be be deliberately pessimistic at any point um well it's not in my nature to be anything other than um 
I'm often known as meniscus man. My, my glass isn't half full, it's overflowing, and I'm held together by the meniscus on the surface of water. But, but so it's not my nature to be pessimistic. But the area where we've got to hedge is the idea that we will be, uh, that we will, we will not see the enemy coming. So this takes you to an area where you've got to massively insulate yourself with resilience. I think there's a strategic risk we face, all of us, including Rusi and the Prime's Airbus today. Um, you know, it's the failure of imagination. The, the idea we fail to imagine what might happen or when it could occur, and therefore we're not ready. So it becomes a risk to us because it's unbound. You don't know if you... So this would be, we, we sort of failed to imagine A234 on a door handle in Salisbury, and it unhinged us in some way. COVID came out of the blue slightly and disrupted our national way of working and being and prosperity. So this idea of failure of imagination is, is a problem for us. So we need to be pessimistic about how and what we might have to fight through to secure our national interests. And that's as much about uh, our people, our state, um, the encryption around our communications and disruption through the blockchain could prevent from disruption around our data and our people. You know, our people, we are number one, no, most precious resource, obviously, and you know, we need to make sure we've got the right people who are skilled to adapt to a changing circumstance. You know, uh, typhoon engineers that can help shore up a dam or clinicians that can, you know, set up and stabilize patients coming out of Wuhan two years ago. Um, you know, or the, or the MV Braemar coming out of the Caribbean. Really tough things that we need to skill our people to be ready for anything, uh, but not waste time doing it, but give them this agility of mind, the empowerment and delegation that will allow them to react with confidence and not with trepidation around censure or sanction in some way. So if there is an area of pessimism, which is not in my nature, is that we can't do enough to help our people be ready for what is a very uncertain future that is almost impossible, but not impossible, almost impossible to predict. Hearing you say that, and I cannot help but be reminded of um, the reason why the Naval Review was set up in, in 1913. Yes. And one of their key things was, we are assuming that everybody is going to think how we are, we are being very top down driven. And this is the vehicle to do exactly that, to, to enlighten our people and to innovate. Yeah. Um, I find that fascinating that here we are a century later and we're still having that conversation for yeah. all the right reasons, for all the right well, the reasons. Reason I, the reason I think is that every time, you know, we've become, ex we've become a superb and exceptional at our way in warfare. And so our adversaries move to a different form. You know, it's either scaled in technology or shifted the geographic bias or move from hard power to soft power. And now Russia's executing dark power, you know, the sort of below the line, no rules, no attribution, no uniform, no badge. You know, a different form of warfare because they'll be defeated in battle if they confront us on our high ground. So, our, so I, I judge that this agility of mind and organisation, uh, which was sewn into our integrated review proposal and the outcome, is that we need to be much more able to operate in uncertain circumstances with lesser number of fleets, you know, greater depth, more power, greater agility, more, should we say, multi-role capabilities than single role capabilities uh, for the future. And I think we'll just be continuously tested as we continue, continue to prevail in, you know, the latest form of warfare, whatever that is. Air Marshal Turner, I, I think I'm going to leave it there because you've, you've just smashed, smashed the nail over the head, quite, quite frankly. Um, Notwithstanding our few technical issues, that has been an absolutely um, fascinating, particularly for me, um, down to dive into it. The RAF is the one part, the one part of my game which I need to, which I know I need to raise, and this just infused me to go and go and look at look at it again. Um, Air Marshal Turner, thank you very much. It's much appreciated, um, and uh, we'll hopefully talk again in in the near future. Well, if I may say this, I think, you know, it's organisations like RUSI that keep us at the leading edge by thinking the unthinkable before it's occurred, setting out propositions that allow us to challenge ourselves in new ways and holding us to account against the, the public person, amongst other things, but also in, in many of the novel ways of modern warfare. So absolutely, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity and very happy to stay closely engaged and help in, in, a, you know, in, in the future months and weeks. Thank you very much, sir. Good job. Thank you. 
A Call to Arms is part of the Military Sciences Profession of Arms programme. The show is produced by Pepe Van Arnen and Chris Jones and is sponsored by Airbus. If you enjoyed the show, please rate it and leave a review. Your feedback helps us tailor future interviews to what you, our audience, want to know. RUSI is a membership organisation and it is thanks to our members and sponsors that we are able to maintain our independence, challenge orthodoxy and deliver groundbreaking thought leadership. If you consider yourself to be connected to the profession of arms, then perhaps membership is for you. You can find more information at rusi.org forward slash membership. For less than a price of a good cocktail each month, you can join a growing global community with exclusive access to events, research and insights that put you ahead of your peers. Thank you for tuning in, and I look forward to welcoming you back next month for more from A Call to Arms. Oh, 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 oh,